What's up guys, Black Scout Survival. And I got my good friend Chance Sanders here. What's up guys? And today we're gonna to be talking about uh, escaping evasion, camouflage, cover, and concealment. And we're gonna go over the various uh, types of camouflage, not necessarily the patterns, but the types. We're gonna discuss uh, you know, the seven uh, S's of camouflage. And we're gonna discuss some like movement, you know, uh, low crawl, high crawl, and the sniper crawl. And also just show some different uh, types of uh, improvised camouflage and so we're going to start off with the uh, seven S's of camouflage and this is just like you know make things easier for military guys because we're not that smart so uh, to begin with we're going to talk about the uh, silhouette first and uh, what we're talking about is the human form it is easily seen we can easily identify that shape um, you know we can pick it up in the in the wilderness very easily you can you know I remember I was a little kid and I you know, see see somebody walking in the wilderness very very easy just because we're we we've seen this shape and we know what it is so much, and we're you know natural hunters, so we can pick up on that and detect uh, you know just the human outline as well as animals. You can tell animal shape as well. Um, the uh, head, the head and the shoulders. You have to break that up. The V's of the arm and the V of the crotch. You know, these are just not natural shapes that's found in, in the wilderness, so it's something that you really need to break up. One thing I find amusing is that uh, if you look at uh, the natural order of things, is that uh, small animals, babe, like baby animals, are usually furry and, and soft. And it's kind of like a natural camouflage, you know, because they can't really, you know, get away or know how to defend themselves at that point in time. So it's a way that they can you know, actually survive. You know, you see little ducks and stuff like that, little puppies, they're real furry and real soft and it's a natural camouflaging for them. We're now gonna talk about shape. Uh, shape, and we're, we're talking about camouflage, the actual shape of the camouflage and irregular patterns uh, also, you know, blend best in most environments. Also the smaller uh, type camouflage, the smaller breakup, usually works better in most environments, especially in woodland environments. Not necessarily like in a desert where everything's kind of flat looking, um, but in a woodland, uh, the smaller patterns work better. That's why digital camouflage is so effective. And uh, you know, the Marine Corps adopted that because it is very, in a very effective camouflage because of those uh, smaller uh, shapes that's broken up. Going along with shape, you know, there's two types of camouflage. There's, there's mimic and disruptive. Uh, mimic camouflage is whenever you're trying to look like something. Disruptive camouflage is when you're trying to look like nothing. Uh, so you kind of just like disappear into the wilderness. And disruptive is obviously better. It's better to look like nothing than to look like something. The next thing we're going to talk about is shadow. Shadow, shadows can be good and bad. Uh, shadows you can hide in, you know, natural shadows in the environment. Uh, you can hide in. It's uh, good to use and use anytime you can. Uh, creating a shadow or casting a shadow is bad because shadows do draw the eye. If you, uh, this is just a tip in case you know you're ever looking for something. If you ever drop something on the ground and you can't find it, if you take a flashlight, hold it at an angle, and make anything on the ground cast a shadow, you'll usually find whatever you're looking for. So casting a shadow will definitely give away your position. The next S, and, and I've covered this in previous uh, videos uh, on escape and evasion, is that smell. And, you know, like during the Vietnam War, some of the snipers would eat the, the local cuisine and they would only, you know, be around it because that, that types of smells can definitely give off. You know, especially if you ever go to an Asian food restaurant, you notice how your clothes smell after you leave there. You know, so, so definitely, you know, foods, different, different types of foods, depending on the ethnicity uh, of the food, gives off stronger smell than others. So if you're ever in an area, you definitely want to eat whatever the locals are eating. You always want to refrain from strong smelling grooming products, whether it be cologne, uh, after deodorant, you know, shampoo and stuff like that. Basically, can definitely be smelled. The other thing is tobacco. Tobacco can be smelled very easily. I remember uh, when I was in the Marine Corps in boot camp and uh, you know, I, I dipped, or I, I used to dip during that time, uh, but it, I mean, obviously in boot camp I didn't. 
but uh, during that time I, I wanted to dip really bad. But I remember being on a rifle range and I would smell dip from, you know, the drill instructors, wintergreen dip, you know, and they'd be, you know, real far away from me, but I'd still smell it. So that's, that's one thing uh, that, you, you know, you want to be careful of, and as well as cigarette smoke and obviously smoke from your fire. All right, guys, next thing we're going to talk about is shine. Shine is something that you want to avoid in the wilderness. Uh, very few things in nature give off a shine. Uh, water will shine. Uh, water on leaves and stuff like that will shine but in general there's not much shine in nature so you want to make sure that you uh, don't wear something like you know this wristwatch I have on now um, if I was trying to be uh, covert or trying to be camouflaged I definitely wouldn't want to wear anything shiny uh, we've gotten pretty good on products as far as uh, weapons and stuff uh, being a matte color and being dulled but if not you can rub some dirt and stuff on them just to keep it from shining as much. Uh, blades, knife blades, things of that nature, if you're really trying to be uh, camouflage, you wouldn't want to use that uh, in any environment that wasn't truly covered and concealed where you had that ability. Another thing you want to make sure that you uh, dull out your, your face to keep your face from shining. If you have a camouflage veil or paint or something like that, use that um, when you're camouflaging. You want to make sure you get your hands and your ears and things that are prominent that are going to shine. Another thing that will give you away in the woods when you're moving around is sound. And you want to do a gear check, uh, jump up and down and make sure that nothing rattles or moves. When if you're carrying water in canteens, make sure you drink, you fill your canteens up and drink all the water out of the canteen so you don't get that sloshing around noise. Um, so it's probably a good idea to, to keep smaller, several smaller containers of water versus one big one that you're not going to be able to empty at one time. Another consideration for sound is Velcro. Uh, a lot of your newer uniforms have Velcro on them. Uh, I prefer, this is my old Marine Corps uh, digital top and everything was buttons and I like that a lot better. Another thing with sound is when you're moving, make sure you try to move around uh, leaves and branches versus brushing past them because that's always going to create a sound signature. Uh, another way of, of dampening your sound or, or your signature is moving when there's other noises in the woods. When the wind is blowing or, or anything else that creates a noise in a background, you want to move slow and you want to move with that noise and if that noise stops, you want to stop. And that brings us to our other point is speed. Your, uh, your speed should be slow enough that you match your environment and that you don't make any undue noise. A lot of people will walk through the woods, especially in parks and places like that, and they move so fast that they miss a lot of wildlife, they miss a lot of animals. And if you just slow down, um, and as you progress, especially, I know it would be hard to do this in an evasion scenario if you're trying to create that distance, time distance gap, but slowing down will allow you to see yeah, possibly your pursuers, which will help you to evade them even better, and also to see other potential threats that are out there. Um, just slow down, go at about a quarter speed of what you normally walk, and if the terrain dictates and the situation dictates, you may have to go at a snail's pace to get where you want to be or to, to stop completely and hide and wait until the next opportunity to move. Okay guys, earlier we talked about disruptive patterns versus mimicking patterns and everything you see before you here is some version of a disruptive pattern. There's, there's nothing here that's trying to mimic a particular um, picture or color or background. Uh, more or less, you're trying to blend in with as many different types of backgrounds as you can, making it more universal, uh, at least for that environment that you're in. One of the things, there's, there's, there's the disruptive, and there's also the, the macro versus micro. Uh, if you look at something like this old uh, jungle tiger stripe, and this is one of the darker patterns, the further you back away from this, the more it turns into just a, a kind of a dark blob. And that's not something you necessarily want to have in the woods. Uh, this pattern here, which is a, uh, a, a Rhodesian conflict, uh, style camouflage 
you'll notice that the patterns are, are very big and that actually works really well due to the fact that even as you get further away from it um, the camel pattern is, is still broken up uh, and, and this type of pattern has been used all the way back to at least World War II era with the large macro uh, camouflage. Over here you have something that is a, a homemade spray painted and uh, it actually works works pretty daggone well. The great thing about your homemade stuff is you can tailor it to fit the actual environment you're going to be in. Uh, a lot of these patterns are still very bright. You'll notice that this one is probably the darkest and absorbs the most light in, in that sense as far as being bright. Uh, this is an example of a mimic pattern. You can see it's actually uh, looks just like a picture of a bunch of leaves and I'm sure that's what they did when they manufactured it. These are very popular among hunters. A lot of your hunting style camouflage has been ever since real tree and tree bark and those styles came out back in the 80s um, were very popular with hunters hunting up in deer stands and stuff. Um, and, and it does work. Uh, another thing you want to be careful of is the shine of your equipment as far as what the material is made out of. You can tell this bag is a waterproof bag and it's, it's pretty shiny. Um, some of your, your rain gear, if it's the, the uh, more rubberized type, can be shiny as well. The Gore-Tex seems to absorb um, that shine fairly well. So those are just things to consider. Along the lines of camouflage, I just want to take a quick minute to talk about something I refer to as combination camouflage. And it's basically what I wear most all the time in, in, in the wilderness where I will wear more uh, earth tone colors like this uh, shirt here and I have on tan pants. So I'm, I have different colors, but they're all earth tones. And as a matter of fact, uh, I was wearing this, you know, some of my field clothes like this. Uh, 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 on a creek over here a few months back and a, and a buck walked right up on me he didn't see me and uh, so I mean there's some they have some very very good eyesight but you know having the earth tones and, and not wearing camouflage is good if you're you know moving from an urban environment into a wilderness environment you know uh, you may not have the chance to put on camouflage so wearing earth tones will give you that ability to blend in you know, if it, in wearing what I'm wearing, throwing a boonie cat with a sniper veil, really that's, you know, all you, all you would need. And using the environment to your advantage to camouflage yourself. Another thing you do is take, take my, like my shirt here and you, I could smear mud and charcoal on it and uh, make my own camouflage, like kind of like what Chance was talking about with the, uh, the smock that the, uh, had been painted. So you can, you can make your own, but that's why I'm always a big advocate of earth tone colors. Uh, they blend in, in in the urban environment. You know, you don't really stand out, but also in the wilderness environment, you can use it as a combination camouflage. Now we're going to cover some movement techniques. And we're going to talk about the uh, low crawl, high crawl, and sniper low crawl, also known as the skull dragger. And uh, you want to go ahead and tell a few, a few things about the high crawl. Well, these, all of these crawling techniques are, are used to match the environment and your cover and concealment level. So if you go from a, an area that's uh, very well concealed where you can just stand up and, and walk slowly but normally, uh, as that begins to taper off and your vegetation gets shorter or more sparse, you're going to have to adapt your movements to match that background because you don't want to be silhouetted, you don't want to be standing up and being the highest thing that will definitely make you stand out so kind of like walking in a field if there's a field and the you know the straw or grass is three feet high you don't want to be just walking through it because you're sticking out this is like one of those situations you'd employ one of these techniques exactly. and obviously the higher crawl is a lot faster movement that's whenever you need to you know move fast but still remain pretty much stealth yep um, and a lot of these two are going from one point of, of good concealment to the next crossing danger areas uh, things of that nature. We, we're not really talking about uh, this in a, a in sniper engagement sense, whereas the closer you get to your target, uh, the more you veg up and the more your camouflage becomes critical. Uh, you know, we still want to be able to move at a, at a decent pace, uh, but we've got to match our movements to the environment that we're in. The, like I was saying, the high crawl is much more faster. This is something you'll utilize when crossing a road 
at, at a road bend and things like that. Whenever you need to move quick but still need to remain concealed. The low crawl is, uh, you know, kind of like the mid speed. You know, you, you may see potential threats out there. Um, you may or may not, or you may be close to something and you need to move a little more, you know, covertly. Or you're using your terrain to, you know, move through. So you got a low crawl behind a log or something like that. And then the sniper low crawl, this is whenever, you know, you may have eyes in the vicinity and you have to barely move. You know, you still need to move. You can't stay static. You still need to move. Uh, but, you know, there's potential threats, the hostile threats that could, could see you. One thing I want to bring up, guys, is uh, most of us, if you're going to do something like this, you're probably going to have some kind of gear with you, a backpack or, or some type of bag. Keep in mind that you're going to have to rig up something to drag that bag if you're going into this low crawl, uh, extreme low crawls, you're going to have to be able to move that bag with you because that adds a lot depending on how big it is. Uh, you bend over, that backpack is still sticking up. Huge silhouette, yeah. It, it definitely. Um, so you're going to have to rig up some type of a, a dragging system to bring that bag along with you. And that adds a whole different dimension to the quality of the bag that you may want to consider carrying. Is it something that will withstand uh, being drugged through the woods and, and also looking at things on that bag that are going to get hung. hung up on stuff. Obviously a, a slick bag is, is going to be a much better uh, choice than something that has a lot of molly or has a lot of pouches and, and things hanging off of it. Um, That's one reason why the military packs are, are you know so stout and if you look at sniper drag bags are made of heavy you know Cordura fabric. Uh, I mean, you can make a hasty drag by using, you know, paracord attached to your belt. Uh, remove your uh, pack straps or fold them in, tuck them in, because the pack straps will be dragging along anything. One thing that works real well is a dry bag. Keep a dry bag big enough to fit your pack inside of, a camouflage dry bag. Fit your pack inside of. That way you can put your pack inside the dry bag, wrap it up, and use it as the drag bag because it's slick. And then you could put something like a sniper bail over the top of it. To break it up as well you know and make it look more matte than the shiny glossy finish of a uh, dry bag so that's just uh, one technique you can use and then pretty well so anyhow guys hope you enjoyed this video um, hopefully uh, you got some instruction from it anyhow guys make sure to subscribe to our channel because we put out a few new videos every week and as always thanks for watching